sometimes GPS just does not want to take me where I want to go. So I do look at the map and do my own route sometimes. The other route that it was telling me to do was a lot of mountain routes and a lot of lots of zigzags. I'd rather do another 30 minutes just going forward flat than having to go through mountains. Hello from Wandering Wanda, I'm Marielle. Today we are at Hardin KOA Journey in Montana and the whole KOA park is surrounded by fields. So it's just fields all the way around. In fact that noise you hear is a tractor coming down. There it is. So we're surrounded by fields and I, for some reason there are a lot of flies here and I don't know why. <laughs> okay, it's a very long sight. So an A-class can actually fit in here. So it starts from there and goes all the way beyond the truck. So it's 50 amps, water in, water out, water pressure is pretty good and it's absolutely leveled. So didn't have to put any leveling blocks down. And we are at an end cap. And they are all buddy sites. The 50 amps, water sewer, full hookup. They're all buddy sites. Now I normally don't like buddy sites, but I've figured out that the further to the right I go to get away from the utilities, the better. So if I see a buddy site from now on, I'm gonna go as far to the right as possible. <sighs> it's a very small park. There are two national parks here that we will be visiting. And would I stay at this park again? I probably not. So it's a no. Only because of the buddy sites and the amount of flies that are here. Don't like that part. I think they're horse flies, so they actually bite. I'm not really sure. One hasn't landed on me yet, and if it has, I've killed it. Right, we're gonna go to the trash can, get rid of some garbage, and walk around the park. So these sites over here have no sewer. They're water only and electric. I think they're 30 amps. And then the site across the way are tent sites. Okay, they do have a few cabins. I've never realized it until yesterday when I pulled in that there were a lot of motorcyclists that actually rent out these cabins. Hello. <laughs> Staff is very friendly. Especially Nancy, she's wonderful. <laughs> Good morning. Okay, these sites don't have sewer. Just water and electric. Do you have a pool, which I don't ever use. It's just full of kids peas in it. Okay, these are full hookups, 50 amps over here also. So it is a nice end cap. Today we are at the Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area. 
This dam, named after the famous Crow Chairman Robert Yellowtail, harnessed the waters of the Bighorn River and turned its variable stream into a magnificent lake. Bighorn Lake extends approximately 71 miles through Wyoming and Montana. Hopefully we can see something from up here. Ooh, we can see the dam. <laughs> okay, that's the dam. Wow, it's an impressive dam. We are at Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument in Crow Agency, Montana. In 1876, the U.S. government launched a military campaign upon Soy. That doesn't sound right. Sequoia? And Cheyenne Indians who refused to live in the Great Soy Reservation. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and 647 men attacked the village of 18,000 to 10,000. When it was over, Custer and hundreds of others were dead. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Such as the Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, the Spanish-American War, and you guys will see a large mound, which is known as the Indian Memorial. Established in 2003, it commemorates the sacrifice of five tribes, the Crow, the Rikara, a handful of Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Sioux. So these tribes all fall on the battle of the Little Bighorn to protect their diverse ways of life. So also you guys can look to your right and you guys will see the 7th Cavalry Memorial which sits on a mass grave of about 210 soldiers and 10 civilians. So also if you guys get a chance to walk up here and look into the black gated area there, you guys will see some white marble markers inside and one white marble marker in particular with a black shield on it. That will indicate where Custer's body was found. And although he died here, his body was later then moved and buried at West Point, New York. <laughs> so as you pass that, we'll be coming down this stretch right here and coming down this stretch, this will be what's known as Battle Ridge. And you guys can look to your right, and you guys will start seeing white marble markers, and also coming up to your left, you guys will see white marble markers on the side of the hills. These will indicate where the bodies, or the soldiers' bodies were found throughout the battlefield, after the battle. So we're actually one of the only battlefields in the United States that has these features, that has the white marble markers exactly where the soldiers' bodies were found. Wow. So also you guys can look to your right, and coming up on the side of the hill right here, you guys will see two red granite markers on the side of the hill. So these red granite markers will indicate where the warrior's bodies were found. <laughs> and there's actually one coming up right next to the road right here. So there's actually over 38 red granite markers that are found so far. And they're still looking for remains, even to this day. Yep, there's one right there. So, three days after this battle, officers Terry and Gibbon will come across what they think is a mass buffalo slaughter, but will actually be the 7th Cavalry. So they will then get assigned burial duty, where they will bury the dead in shallow graves of only 6 inches deep. Custer will actually get the deepest grave of 18 inches. So whenever, the only way they would recognize a soldier is by their facial hair or by tattoos, because some of them were so bashed in and mutilated they were unrecognizable. For example, Thomas Custer, was, his head was so smashed in that they described it as a human pancake. And the only way they recognized him was a tattoo, TWC, for Thomas Weir Custer. And whenever they would recognize a soldier, they would write their name on a piece of parchment paper, stick that parchment paper into a leftover or an empty shell casing, and tack that shell casing into a leftover teepee pole. And they would post that teepee pole in the ground where the soldier fell. 
But two years after this battle, those those tape poles were then replaced with the white marble markers that you see now. So this area to your right, this would be what's known as Greasy Grass Ridge. Back then, at the time after this battle, the Native Americans never referred to this battle as the Battle of the Little Bighorn or Custer's Last Stand. They actually referred to this battle as the Battle of the Greasy Grass. Because at this time, the grass would be about waist height and it would have a shiny, greasy secretion to it. So when the soldiers and the horses would run through it, it would leave a shiny polish on the soldiers' boots and under the horses' bellies. Well, back in 1983, our so that greasy grass would cover all the valley here, all the way across the highway and even the bluffs across the highway. And all the way to the valley to your left also would be all covered in greasy grass. But back in 1983, we had somebody visiting the battlefield who actually tossed a cigarette which ignited a wildfire that burned all the greasy grass in this area. So the greasy grass unfortunately don't grow in this area anymore. So this wildfire would actually ignite 90% of the battlefield on fire. So the whole battlefield would be on fire and the only 10% that wouldn't be on fire would be the cemetery part. So that wildfire would actually lead to Dr. Richard A. Fox to discovering over 5,000 artifacts from this battlefield or from this battle such as glasses, wedding rings, boots, arrowheads, bullets, buttons, and things are still getting discovered to this day. Just last year, we had a button get discovered from this battle. So right here, we'll be passing a cattle guard where we'll be leaving National Preservation Land and going back onto the Crow Reservation. But nothing to worry about, I got you guys back. So we good, so we good. <laughs> so this portion of land right here, this is actually owned by the Rilberg family, who are part of the Crow tribe, but they're kind enough to let everyone drive through here and learn a little bit of history. So as we come further along, you guys can look to your right and up. Once these little hills get out of the way, you guys will be able to see into the valley. And in the valley, you guys will see a blue house with a slanted roof. And it'll be coming out behind this little hill right here in about 10 seconds. It would be that blue house right there. So that blue house will mark the northern end of Blissing Cabin at the time. So back then, the Native Americans would always put their strongest and most fiercest warriors on the northern and the southern ends of their encampment. So in this encampment at the time, on the northern end, it would be the Cheyenne, and on the southern end, it would be the Sioux. This encampment was estimated to be about a mile and a half wide stretching across the valley and about three miles long going into the valley. So imagine looking in the valley here and seeing hundreds and hundreds of teepees and lodges stretching throughout the valley. This encounter was estimated to have about seven to 8,000 people in it with a warrior force of about two to 4,000 warriors. And they were estimated to have a horse herd between 20 to 50,000 head of horses. So imagine looking on the bluffs across the highway over there and seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of horses. To me, that's heaven. So, <laughs> so as you make your way into this uh, coolie right here, this coolie will actually be known as Medicine Tau Coolie. And I'll get more into this coolie on the way back. So as you come over here, you guys can look to your right, coming around this next corner, you guys will be able to see the Little Bighorn River. And across the Little Bighorn River right here, you guys will see those bleachers, and those bleachers will actually mark where the women and children watch this battle happen. Nah, just kidding, no it's not. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually where the real bird family hosts the reenactment that's held every year on the anniversary of the battle. <laughs> so that reenactment will be held on the weekend of June 25th every, every year. So <laughs> this is actually one of the only reenactments that's held on the actual battlefield also. Awesome. So usually in the tree line there across the river, you'd see tents and camps being set up months before this reenactment was held. Because people come from all over the world to audition to participate to be in this reenactment. But only a handful of people can pick to be soldiers. Also, you guys can look to your right at this hill to your guys right here. Right here, this will be what's known as the Crow Bluffs. That'll be where that'll actually be where the Crow Scouts gather to watch the battle begin. Because before the battle started, Custer would release his Crow Scouts because they were on contract with Custer. And in their contract, all they were supposed to do was locate Sitting Bull and Crazy Horses in Canada. And they did that here. So once they did that, they were then released. But there would be one Crow Scout by the name of Curly who would stick around and watch the whole of the battle. And he would eventually become the first interpreter for the battle. Though a majority of the Native Americans at this encampment at the time would be the Sioux. And the Sioux are a very large tribe, which consists of three major branches. The Lakota, the Dakota, and the Nakota. We'll be focusing on the Lakota, which consists of seven sacred campfires. 
or subgroup tribes such as Blackfeet, Brule, Hung Papa, Minikanju, Ogallala, Sansart, and Batuken. So six out of those seven subgroups will reside in this encampment at the time, all but the Tuken. So now I'll be talking about some of the major events leading up into this battle. 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. In 1868, believing it would be cheaper to feed rather than to fight these Native Americans, representatives of the United States government signed a treaty at Fort Laramie. But with 15,000 Native Americans in attendance, such as the Crow, Cheyenne, Sioux, and other tribes of the Great Plains, this would actually become one of the first largest gatherings ever recorded, and they would all get designated permanent reservations. So imagine still looking into this valley here and still seeing hundreds and hundreds of teepees and lodges. This is still the middle of the encampment right here. So imagine seeing thousands of Native Americans in the encampment down there. So not in attendance at this treaty signing would be Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, and their bands, who at the time would be fighting to protect their people's way of life. So <laughs> the Black Yard the Sioux are given the Black Hills in that area, and my tribe, the Crow, are actually given 38 million acres, stretching from Absaroki, the Bozeman, Livingston, and stretching all the way to Billings. But eventually, we will be reduced down to only 2.2 million acres to this day. So, <laughs> Panic of 1873. After the Civil War, a financial crisis triggered an economic depression in the United States. The stock market crashed, leading to one of the first Great Depressions, immigrants flooding lands into the East. In dire need of some sort of income, the government sent Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer on an expedition to look for new core locations in the Black Hills. <laughs> this will lead to the 1874 Black Hills Gold Rush. So in 1874, Custer will lead this expedition with a total of 500 men, consisting of soldiers, miners, geologists, and journalists. Eventually, gold is discovered in the Black Hills and word is brought back to Congress by one of the journalists exaggerating that there's so much gold in the Black Hills that when you walk through it, you will have nuggets on the top of your boots. Basically describing the Black Hills as being paved with gold. So eventually, thousands of pioneers would start swarming into Sioux land, pushing them into unceded territory. Pioneers would go from 1,500 to 15,000 in a one year span. Another reason the Sioux were moving off the reservation was because they had to deal with a corrupt Indian agent who happened to be President Grant's brother by the name of Orville Grant. So because these Native Americans were all moving off the reservation, Custer would get curious and he would investigate why. He would find out why he would testify against Grant, describing reservations as a disgrace. But Custer would eventually lose his case. He would then get demoted and now under the command of General Terry. So at this point in time, as the Black Hills are, as, as there's so much gold being found in the Black Hills at this time, President Grant, he will offer the Sioux $12,000 for their Black Hills, but they will refuse. They will refuse this. And then after they refuse, he will, he will start this uh, ultimate, he will make this ultimatum. But after this, after all this battle is over and everything is passed, in night art, after, the, the, after this battle, the government will still take the Black Hills from the Sioux. Even though it is their land, they will still take it from them. And in 1980, the Sioux will be awarded a hundred million dollars for, the, for their Black Hills being wrongfully taken. But the Sioux, they will refuse this also. So that hundred million dollars that they offered them for the hills being wrongfully taken, that is still gathering up in the bank to this day. It's at 10 point something billion right now. Because the zoo, they don't recognize that money. They just want to keep their Black Hills. So that money will still continue to gather up. So after this, all right. So Grant's ultimatum in 1875. At this point, the Sioux are moving into unceded territory and eventually onto Crow land. President Grant at the time is desperate for the Black Hills, but he needs two thirds of the Sioux chief's signatures to acquire it. But most of them already left the reservation already. So then he will issue an ultimatum that describes all Native Americans in unceded territory to be deemed hostile, if not returned to their reservation by January 31st of 1876. This ultimatum is issued during one of the harshest winters ever reported. So the Sioux, they don't get word of this until the upcoming spring, because no one wants to deliver this message in the dead of this winter. So 
this ultimatum will start the Centennial Campaign, which will enact the three-pronged pitcher attack after the Sioux supposedly refused. So General Terry and Lieutenant Colonel Custer will come from Fort Abraham Lincoln in the north, Colonel Gibbons from Fort Ellis in the west, and General Crook from Fort Betterment in the south. The purpose of this attack was to push the Sioux into an area, fight them into submission, and escort them back onto their reservation. Planning to have three columns of men to move on a certain date, Cook and his men arrived in the Rosebud area. And the Rosebud area will be on the other side of these mountains right here in front of us. And these mountains in front of us will be what's known as the Wolf Teeth Mountains. And on the southeastern area, on the other side of these mountains, will be the Rosebud area. And that'll be where Cook and his men arrived at. So getting there first, they will come across what they think is Crazy Horses in Kenman but will actually be a Cheyenne encampment. So Crook, he will give order to Colonel Joseph Reynolds to go and attack this encampment, to take all the horses, take all the food, but to burn all the lodges. So Reynolds, he will go and attack this encampment. From where Crook and his men in the Rosebud area, there, this encampment will be about 90 miles east in the Powder River region. And it'll be what's known as the Powder River fight. So Reynolds will go and he will attack this encampment, but he will defy Crook's orders. As to where he will take all the horses, but he will kill and mutilate multiple women and children. And it is said that they would kill the pregnant women and they would cut open their stomachs and they would pull out the fetuses. And they would pull out the fetuses and they would wear them on their heads like helmets and they would parade them around, disgracing these Native Americans. <laughs> so from the closest, or from the sharp, from the ridge to the closest barricade will be about 700 yards. And the sharpshooter will take out at least 16 give or take soldiers. So very skilled marksmen. That's so, 700 yards. Yep, 700 yards, yep. So eventually Reno and Ben Team would focus fire up on this ridge. It'll be this ridge right here to you guys right coming up. So eventually Reno and Ben Team would focus fire on this ridge. And eventually the firing would cease and the firing from the ridge would cease. And after this battle is concluded, the soldiers will make their way up to the top of the ridge to look for the remains of the sharpshooter. But when they get up there, they will find no remains. All they will find oh. <laughs> All they will find when they get up there is a bloody buffalo robe. Empty shell casings belonging to a rolling block rifle and a bloody trail leading back into the encampment. So to this day, people don't know who that sharpshooter actually is. Some people think that it was a French fur trader working with the Sioux. Some people think that it was a Cheyenne woman. Some people even think that it was a ghost. So I guess it's up to you guys to decide. So right here, we'll go making way to Weird Point over here where we drive in between those two hills. And that will actually be the tallest point at the battlefield at this time. And Weir Point is actually named after Thomas Weir. And Thomas Weir would have, would have been with Reno Bentine and their men over here at Reno Bentine site. But he would ask Reno and Bentine to go and check, to take a company of men and go and check on Custer and his men at Last Stand Hill. He would ask this three times, but he would get denied three times. As to where the fourth time, he wouldn't ask. He would just take a company of men and start making his way over to Weir Point this way not knowing at the time that Custer and his men are already meeting their demise at Last Stand Hill. So as he's making his way to Weir Point here, <laughs> oh, as before we get to Weir Point, coming up to your guys' right, you guys will see the plaque for Sharpshooter's Ridge, and right next to this plaque, you guys will see a white marble marker coming up right here on your guys' right. So the plaque for Sharpshooter's Ridge, and right next to that plaque is a white marble marker, and that white marble marker will be the marker for Vincent Taro's. And Vincent Charles will actually be with Thomas Weir and his company of men making their way over to Weir Point. So I'll get to his death here in a second. So Vincent Charles' body will actually not be found right there. It will actually be found right way at the bottom, at the bottom of the coulee there. So I'll get to his death here in a second. So as Thomas Weir and his company of men are making their way over to Weir Point up here, they will get to the top and they will be able to see all the way to Last Stand Hill from there. So they will look in their spy glasses all they will be able to see at Last Stand Hill is a cloud of smoke, dust, and gunfire. And then they will see blue coats on horseback shooting at the ground. So then him and his men being over, they will start shooting in the sky, whooping and hollering, thinking that they've gotten a victory. So then these men at Last Stand Hill, they will hear the gunfire and they will see Thomas Weir and his men up here, whooping and hollering and jumping up and down. So they will start making their way up here to Weir Point, to Thomas Weir and his men. So if you guys look to your right, there's a plaque for Weir Point. That'll be where their bodies will be found. So there was an account that one soldier said that he was, as he was over here, there were so many arrows getting shot into the sky that it looked like they blocked out the sun. <laughs> so as these soldiers are slowly getting taken out, they will slowly try to fight their way to Last Stand Hill. 
these men that counted will slowly try to make their way to the left sand hill at this time. So here, this is what's known as the Horse Holders Ravine right here. If you guys look to your right, you guys see those are white marble markers, about four or five people apart. So every fifth, sixth, or seventh person will be a horse holder, holding every man before his horse. So holding all the ammunition. So here, the warriors would know this. <coughs> so the warriors would know this, and they would they would shoot and kill the horse holders down there. And then Cheyenne women, they would go and they would, they would run down there with their buffalo hides and they would scare away all the horses, scare away all the soldiers ammunition. So at this time you would see them, the, these markers in big old groups. This is where they would try to gather up and slowly make a formation, try to make their way to Last Hill. And Crazy Horse, he would lead a charge into these big old groups of men as they're running out of ammo. So they're slowly, you could see them slowly overwhelming these soldiers here as their groups are slowly getting smaller, as they're slowly running out of ammo, fighting with the butts of their guns fighting with their knives until they were dull and now fighting with their hands. So now you'll start seeing them in groups of twos and threes. This is where they are trying to fight back to back, trying to watch each other's back as these Native Americans are overwhelming them. So that they'll be fighting back to back here, fighting hand to hand, toe to toe combat with these Native Americans. So here this is where Sitting Bull would give these soldiers here a shout out, saying that they were worthy of being warriors, saying they were fearless, that they fought to the death. And these soldiers here trying to make their way from Calhoun's Hill, not one single soldier will make it to Last Stand Hill. Not one single soldier. So, here this is where Custer on your guys left, Custer will try to make one final advancement into the encampment down Deep Ravine right here. But he would get, he would make it to the tree line, but he would get pushed back by suicide warriors. Suicide warriors are warriors that take a vow the night before battle to take, give their life up in this next battle for the wealthy of the tribe. So they would push back Custer up here and you could see uh, in Deep Ravine now there are remains, there are uh, white marble markers and those are remains as he was getting pushed back as to these warriors are slowly taking out his men. So what he has left up here and him and his men will make their way up here to Last Stand Hill. And they, he will give his order, he will give one final order. He will tell his soldiers to create breastwork. He will tell them to shoot their horses in the head to create barricades. And this is where the soldiers knew that they would not be going home after shooting their only transportation. This is where they knew they would not be leaving this battle. Because some of them would be so terrified, they would look at each other, count to three, and shoot each other. And some of them would be so scared, they would close their eyes and they would kill themselves. Being so scared, not wanting to die by these Native Americans. And there would be one chief by the name of Two Moons who would be on a southern hill over there. He would be watching Last Sand Hill happening as these, uh, as these hundreds of warriors are surrounding Custer and his men. And he would describe it as, as a rock getting surrounded by water in a creek, saying there were so much warriors surrounding Custer and his men. And Custer and his men would be taken out so fast that it was as fast as a starving man eats his dinner. So then, after this, Custer he will be found with a bullet wound to his chest and a bullet wound to his head. And then he will be found with his ears gouged out. Because at this time, the Cheyenne woman would find his body and would use their beating house and they would stab the insides of his ears. Because before any of this even started, Custer, he would have a Cheyenne wife and he would have a Cheyenne child. And he would make a promise to the Cheyenne tribe that he would never attack a Cheyenne encampment or battle the Cheyenne tribe ever again. And after he makes that promise, that is when Reynolds <coughs> decimates the Cheyenne encampment. So then the Cheyenne still took that personally. Even if it wasn't Custer, it was still his government. So they still took that personally. So when they found his body here, they would stab the insides of his ears, thinking that maybe he will listen. Maybe he will hear his promise in the next life. So that's all I have for this tour. So thank you guys for choosing Abtella Gat Tours. Have you guys, I hope you guys have a great day. If you guys have any questions, I'll gladly answer them on the outside of the bus. Since we are in Crow territory or reservation land, or surrounded by it in this national park, part of the legend of why they scalped people was at the top of your head is where your soul resides and part of your soul is also the hair that's connected to the top of your head so that's why they scalped you they wanted to take away your soul according to the crow people so right now I am soulless since I have no more hair so not only am I heartless, I'm also soulless. Very interesting. I guess they didn't have bald people in the Crow Nation. Okay, there is actually RV parking here. But it's tight. <laughs> it's 
parallel parking only. 